Ominous words are words that are used to give the worrying impression that something very bad is about to happen. Like the, the classic dark clouds gathered overhead, or the more contemporary words, breaking COVID-19, press conference at 10.15. Or the one I used to dread the most, just wait till your dad gets home. Ominous words give the worrying impression that something very bad is about to happen. And the book of Exodus opens with ominous words. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now Joseph, of course, was a hero in Egypt. He saved Egypt from a famine. And so the families of Joseph, the people of Jacob, the sons of Jacob, later called Israel, they settled peacefully in Egypt for many years. But at the end of Genesis, Joseph dies. Years pass. And all Joseph's heroics, well, they're in the distant past. And a new king of Egypt rises to power, and he has no regard for what Joseph did in Egypt. In fact, his main worry, his big worry, is now the swarm of Israelites, of Jewish people that fill his land of Egypt. It's this population boom of foreign people. It's time to cull them or they'll overrun us, he thinks. And Pharaoh's policy is pretty much the policy of every kind of tyrant, dictator in history since. First is to start up the propaganda machine. Behold, he says, the people of Israel are too many. They're too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies and they'll fight against us and escape from the land. So you always have to sell the reason. Even if there is no real threat, you have to sell the reason to the people as the, as the reason for their action. Step two, of course, is to reposition this, these people in society. They set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities, Pithom and Ramses. They're repositioned. They were a free people, an independent people, who now become enslaved. And then step three is, is of course, to gradually reduce them in size. Verse 15, orders Pharaoh orders the Hebrew midwives to kill all the Hebrew baby boys at birth. Notice he doesn't want to do it himself. And so he commands the Hebrew midwives to kill them at birth. Now, of course, it's hard not to see the parallels here with World War II. Adolf Hitler followed this very same pattern, stirring speeches, starting up the propaganda machine to sell this idea that the Jewish people were the source of the world's problems and to give them this vision of what it would be like if the problem was removed. And then he repositioned them in society from a free and an independent people to an enslaved people, brings them into concentration camps to break their spirit. And then, of course, the final solution, the SS death camps to eradicate the problem once and for all. Corrie ten Boom, a well-known story uh, about what Corrie ten Boom and her family did in the midst of this war. She describes what these death camps were like. She writes, by 4.30 a.m., we had to be standing at parade attention in blocks of 100 women, 10 wide, 10 deep. Sometimes after hours of this, we would gain the shelter of the barracks only to hear the whistle. Everybody out, fall in for roll call. From there, all day long and often into the night, came the sounds of hell itself. They were not the sounds of anger or of any human emotion, but of a cruelty altogether detached. Blows landing in regular rhythm, screams keeping pace. We would stand in our ten deep ranks with our hands trembling at our sides, longing to jam them against our ears to make the sounds stop. And this was life for them. This is life for the people of God in Egypt. The summary statement of their experience is that they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work. As slaves, they made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick. 
And in all kinds of work in the field, in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. The tide of evil and pain and suffering is here rushing hard against God's people. Just imagine a a mighty rushing river flowing downstream in one direction. What can you possibly do to stop a mighty rushing flood like that? But Actually, here we see two little rocks that kind of plant themselves in the middle of that rushing flow. And their names are Shipra and Pua, the Hebrew midwives who refuse to carry out Pharaoh's command to kill the Hebrew babies. It says, but the midwives feared God and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the male children live. And I think this is actually a reminder in the tide of evil, the rushing tide of of evil that we experience in our time, it's very easy to think, well, anything that I do isn't really going to make much difference, is it? I mean, you might as well actually just go with the flow. But this act of resistance actually does make a difference. Their resistance does actually reach the halls of power because it seems that after some time, Pharaoh realizes that actually Hebrew boys are still being born. And so he confronts the midwives about why they disobeyed his order. And it's interesting because you notice in the text that their answer to him seems like a little bit of gymnastics with the truth. They say, well, the Hebrew women are more vigorous than the Egyptians. They give birth before we could get there. Now, maybe this is actually true. Maybe the Hebrew women were just more vigorous in giving birth and their labors were quick. Or maybe the midwives just made sure they caught every traffic light on the way to the delivery. Still, their words are interesting because they seem to have a misleading effect about their true motivation for their civil disobedience. And many have raised this as a bit of an ethical problem. Are you allowed to lie for the greater good? For example, should Corrie ten Boom and her family have hidden the Jews in her home and when the Nazi soldiers came looking for them, they misled them? Perhaps that might be a good ethics conversation for after the service. But I think we need to be careful that we don't miss the greater point. We're being asked to see that because they feared God, the God of creation, the giver of life, that they stood in resistance to Pharaoh's order for death. They stood on the side of God when it was almost impossibly difficult to do so. And we read that because of that, God actually blesses the faith of the midwives. And so we can actually see that in this, God actually blesses them. And he gives them families as a result. That's what we're being asked to look at, the blessing of God because of their stand. These two little rocks in the midst of this tide, this rushing river of evil. There are shining lights of faith seeking to hold back the forces of evil. But it's seemingly just for a moment because just as the chapter began with ominous words for the people of God, so the chapter ends with ominous words. The Pharaoh doubles down on his evil and it says he commanded all of his people, all of his people, everyone is now in on it. All of his people, every son that is born of the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. And I want to look at four things that this teaches God's people about the days that we live in. And the first one is this. God's people will go through suffering. God's people will go through suffering. You see, throughout history, God's people have never been able to just put their feet up and relax. As soon as the church was born in the New Testament, we see the beginning of persecution with the stoning of Stephen. We often forget that every one of the disciples, bar one, was martyred for their faith. And just this week, in our time, Open Doors, a ministry to the persecuted church, released the World Watch List, which is an annual report which ranks all the countries where Christians face the most persecution and discrimination. The report says 
that 340 million Christians in our world today are persecuted. One in eight Christians. North Korea was again number one on that list. To be a Christian in North Korea is basically a death sentence, or at the very least, will land you in a labor prison camp. And it's estimated there's about 50,000 to 70,000 Christians who are currently in North Korean prison camps. The report also noted this increase of persecution in China, using technology to uh, uh, put surveillance upon Christians and Christian activity in China. Many Chinese in the last five to ten years have been forced into re-education camps. And of course, we aren't quite there in the West where we are. But we have, over the last hundred years, seen a shift in, uh, in, uh, in, in our time from being a people of God fearing to instead God hating. In 1901, at the census, 90% of people in our population in Australia identified as Christian. In 2016, that number was reduced to 52%, including, you know, all those, all that sort of in, in, um, in that category, that includes Catholics and then all the denominations of Protestantism. For the first time, however, the highest category of all of those, um, you know, that category of religion, 30% identified as having no religion, and that was the, the highest proportion of all. In the 18 to 34 age bracket, only 12% identified as Christians. And so we can see a little bit of a glimpse of the future that we're looking at in terms of faith. We have been undergoing a shift, and what that means is, is that we're seeing more and more policies and laws proposed and pressure applied upon Christians and the church to get in line with the 21st century. You're an archaic kind of people. Get in line with the new world. And in fact, the evils that have happened in the church, the flaws, the, the horrible things that have happened within the church are being pointed at by the world as the reason why the church needs to change, why the church needs to get with the times, that the church is actually the source of the world's problems and religion in general. You zoom in even further on our personal lives, and you actually see that Christians are not spared from suffering. Christians are not spared from tragedy or trial and struggle. We're not spared from depression. We're not spared from being hurt by other people or from spiritual attack. In fact, God's people are the target of spiritual attack from the enemy. Even in our work, our work is toil and struggle, part of the curses on humanity because of sin were that we would experience hard toil, discomfort that comes from work, that women would experience pain in childbirth. It really is true. What Paul and Barnabas said to the Acts church, it is through many trials and tribulations that you shall see the kingdom of God. In 1 Peter 4, verse 12, Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you as though something strange is happening to you. You see, suffering upon God's people is not something to be considered as strange, but to be normal. God's people will suffer. And we actually have to see this clearly. We have to be prepared for this, this reality. Because you're just as likely today to walk into a church and to hear the opposite said, that it's actually through much blessing that it's actually through much prosperity, physical prosperity in your life today that you shall see the kingdom of God. I, I want to help you see this, church. This one is so important that as a church, we face the reality that in the times in which we live, God's people will suffer. It is important to actually have a theology of suffering, not just a theology of prosperity. You see, that, that message does not work in North Korean labor prison camps. You can't go there and sort of strut around a stage and say, you know what, I think this year you're going to be blessed in your life and all you have to do is have enough faith and put a little bit more money in the, in the offering and you're going to get all your heart's desire. I want to tell you, do not, in the time that we live in, give in to that message. Do not, I'm telling you, as a brother, as somebody who loves you, as a Christian, do not give in to that message of our time. Because that is not what the New Testament teaches. That is not what the New Testament prepares us for. The New Testament shows us that, 
until God comes for his people, that God's people are to expect suffering. And so we need to have a theology of suffering. We need to count the cost as a Christian of what it might mean, what it might look like in the future to be a Christian, that it might not look at look like having all our comforts and having all our rights, and that actually it might mean that you have to be prepared to be on a losing team. And you actually have to have the kind of stuff that's needed in order to stand in that day. And that is what the New Testament prepares us for. It doesn't prepare us for all riches and glory on this side of eternity. It doesn't do that at all. Church, don't give in to that lie. Don't give in to that message and you can go anywhere and hear it today. It's not true. Keep your eye on the word. Understand what God's preparing us for. See the evil days that you live in and make sure you know where you are with the Lord. We need to see this. God's people will suffer. The second thing that we need to see is that God's people must understand why God allows suffering. Why does God allow suffering? You see, chapter 1 of Exodus, we, we see that God's people are multiplying in number in the foreign land of Egypt, but that's not the land that we, we saw last week. That's not the land that God promised. And, and you need to think about this. What happens if you take the suffering out of this story? So if you actually just lift the suffering out and remove it, what happens to the story? Well, basically what you have is you end up with God's people simply just blending in with Egypt forever and a day, just living in Egypt. And over time, they take on the practices of Egypt and the beliefs of Egypt, and they start worshipping the gods of Egypt, and they actually lose their saltiness as the distinct chosen people of God. And so you need to catch this about the story. If you take the suffering out of this story, what you actually have is a people that are no longer set apart for God. And so this suffering is actually a very important instrument. It's a tool that is used to actually set the people of God apart, to bring them actually out from the world, to bring them out from their enemies. You think about this for your own life. What if you were to go back through your life and erase all the trials that you had? erase all the suffering that you have experienced. Well, what you would have is you'd have the new heavens and the new earth. But that's not reality. And so what we have seen is that those things, those trials, those sufferings have actually been used as an instrument in our life. And what they have been doing in our life is actually setting us apart for God. Setting us apart for Him. Now, and we often hear this in our testimony the blessings of suffering. We actually talk about them, and we talk about how what that suffering did was it actually made us call out for God in a way that we never had before. It made us cling on to God in a way that we never had before, and that's my testimony too. I I sometimes look at the the sufferings and the trials I've had in my past, and, and I sometimes lament the fact that now I don't have the same intimacy that I had with God then. And what that suffering was doing in my life, it was actually wedding me to God. It was forcing me off and divorcing me from the world and bringing me and setting me apart for God. It was going to be the landscape and the setting by which God was going to demonstrate his power and bring me to himself. And, and this, is, this is what this, this suffering here is the point of this in the story. God is going to do something here amongst his people. You know, sometimes we, we pity people when we hear about them being persecuted in North Korea and stuff like that, but we, and we think about how hard that must be for them, and yet at the same time, we constantly hear stories of them pitying us because what is happening to the church today is we're, just, we're sort of distorting it because we live in comfort, because we, we live, you know, we just blend in with the world. 
And there's all kinds of compromise and sleepiness, but actually suffering here is this instrument. It's this tool that is used to set a people apart from God. It causes us to run to him, to cling to him, and to stay with him. And this is why in the New Testament, James says this. He says, count it all joy, brothers. Now, no, one, no one's like chipper and happy when you suffer. No one's just like, this is awesome. No one's thinking that. But this is like this deep kind of joy in the midst of suffering because you know that God's actually doing the primary work that he wants to do in your life. It's not to shower with you external riches, but change you from the inside out. Have a look at this. When you count it all joys, all my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces something. It produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see that? You see it, lacking in nothing? What do I lack? Is it physical riches of this time? No, the thing that we lack is more of God working on us on the inside, changing our character, making us more like him. He says, be holy for I am holy. This is the primary purpose. This is what God wants to do in our life. You see, God allows suffering. We've got to understand this. God's people are going to suffer. Why does God allow suffering? Because God wants to set us apart for him, that we may not be wedded to Egypt, but wedded to him. The third thing that we must see, and I think this is really the primary application of this text, is that God's people must stand on God's side. God's people must stand on God's side. And despite all the suffering that's already taking place, despite all the potential suffering for the stand that they make, Shipra and Pua, these Hebrew midnight woodwives, they do not blend in with the flow of evil. Rather, they stand on the side of God who is the creator and the giver of life that we meet in Genesis. They fear God. Who are they? Who are they to follow the orders of Pharaoh who wants to snuff out life? You see, they fear God. It's noticeable in this chapter that God's active presence isn't actually kind of spelled out. And we can often wonder that. Where is God? in the midst of my suffering. But what we do see is we see these two rocks against the, the rushing kind of flood of evil plant themselves in the ground and say, no, we're not, we're not going to obey the orders of Pharaoh. We're going to fear God first. Now, what does that actually mean, to fear God? Well, in, uh, there's a number of examples that we see in the Bible up until this point. In Genesis 22, you know the account of Abraham being asked by God to go up and sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar. And just as he's about to do it, an angel of the Lord from heaven calls out and says, stop, now I know that you fear God. In other words, you considered obedience to God as more important than your own desire and your own sense of security. That's what it means to fear God. Another example in Genesis 42. Uh, Joseph and his brothers, there's like this encounter and Joseph asks his brothers to leave the young son with Joseph. And the brothers, they're very, they're very anxious and worried about that because their father Jacob has already lost Joseph. They don't want to break his heart again by losing another son. But Joseph actually assures them. He says, do this and you will live for I fear God. And what he's saying to them, he's saying, you can trust me because I know that I have to give an account for my life to God. And that's what it means to fear God. It's, it's knowing that every person has to give an account for every deed and action to God. Later on, in Exodus 18, we see Jethro, uh, Moses' father-in-law, say to him, look, there's way too many people and you're the one leader and you're trying to judge between all the people and solve all their matters. And so what you need to do is you need to find some capable men who fear God, honest men who will not accept the bribe. That's what it means to fear God. It means to have this integrity and this honesty about you that knows that God is watching even if no one else is. It's knowing that God sees everything that I do in private, that he's there, that he's real, that he's present. It, it recognises that God is real, 
that he's not just some kind of cartoon God that we've made up for ourselves, but that he's actually present with us in our life. And that weighs on us more than anything else. It weighs on us more than our flesh. It weighs on us more than our sinful desires, more than the devil. We know that God is present. And and I was thinking this yesterday. In our city, we had the Walk for Life. Um, Right now, before our parliament, is a bill that would uh, 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 legalize the termination of a baby in the womb right up to delivery and for a wider range of reasons. And as I listened to people speak yesterday at this rally, it really struck me with this in mind, Exodus 1 in mind. Where is the fear of God in our land? Where is the fear of God? Are we so brazen? Are we so godless that we're going to actually legalize the killing of a 40-week-old baby in the womb? Where is our fear of the living God? That we, we would think that we could take life when God is the giver of life, and God is not just the giver of life in the beginning. When people fell in sin, God put in a plan to redeem life. God is, before the idea of pro-life was given any political baggage or thought or any kind of sort of wing of politics, God is fundamentally pro-life. He gives life and God redeems life. Who do we think that we are? to take life into our own hands and decide when it ends. Where is the fear of God in our land? This is a matter of, of fearing God, and this is, this is a real challenge for every one of us, not just on the issue of abortion, of course. Do you live your life like God is real and present and that nothing is hidden from him? Now, as Christians, we've we got to understand this. We're not given to slavish fear. We're not given to terror fight fear because by our faith in Jesus our fear is gone it is it is removed but even us as followers of Jesus we recognize that our God is holy that we don't just do as we please but we we fear the living God I want to ask us are we living like practical atheists we're going about our lives doing things as if God doesn't exist The midwives, they lived their life as if God did exist. They feared him. And they had a lot to lose by opposing the might of Pharaoh, probably their lives. But Shipra and Pua, they did not rationalize things away to make life easier for them. You notice we do that. We tend to rationalize things. We're faced with an issue. We're faced with a choice. We rationalize it away. We say it's not really that bad to take part in it. And we actually give ourselves excuses like, well, we're under intense pressure. Or this is just, that's just really unreasonable to actually think that you should stand in that moment. It's not that bad. We rationalize things away. But, you know, Shipper and Pua, they actually show us this set of partners that we're supposed to have, even in the midst of suffering. They're just two little rocks against the tide, the rushing tide of evil. And what they show us is that as people of God, we should not go with the flow of evil. We must fear God. And we're in a time of bombardment. We're always being bombarded. As a man, I'm being bombarded all the time. Women among us, you're being bombarded with all kinds of temptations in our world that want us to go with the flow of evil. But we need a generation of men and women who have this said about them. But, and insert your name here, feared God and did not. What is that thing for you? But Andy feared God and did not. What is that thing? It might be as simple as this. Did not click on that image. Did not gossip about their friends. Did not cheat the tax man. Did not sleep around before the covenant of marriage did not cave in and just go with the flow of evil policies of our time, did not just flippantly abuse alcohol, did not hide their faith at work and with their friends. No, they feared God and they did not. That's what we need in our time. That's what the church needs against the flow of evil, people who feared God and did not. 
We must stand on the side of God. And 1 Peter gives us a reason why. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Come out, be set apart from that. And this is a people who are experiencing persecution, who are experiencing suffering. Peter's saying, in this time of trial, come out, be holy as God is holy. He goes on to say, uh, if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, every deed, everything that we do, we'll have to give an account for. The Bible says every word that we speak, we'll have to give an account to God for. He says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. And here's the reason why. Knowing that you were ransomed, you were bought, you were bought out, you were purchased from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. And it wasn't with gold or silver, not with perishable things. God didn't buy us with some kind of created thing like silver or gold. No, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he purchased us with like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That was the the price at which God ransomed our life, set us apart, brought us into his presence. So don't go back to the passions of your former ignorance. Live in keeping with the cost, the precious price of his blood. Sometimes we forget that we're in this spiritual battle This spiritual battle is raging around us. I thought that very thing yesterday. This is not just one side of politics versus the other. This isn't just the people rising up against their government. This is a spiritual battle. The forces of darkness that are are at work. And, And we're daily tempted to go with the flow of evil, but we must fear God. And when we read this in Exodus, we must not think that Pharaoh is just some bad guy just some kind of anomaly in history. No, Pharaoh represents the seed of the serpent who is trying to stamp out God's plan of redemption. We see that right back at the beginning, Genesis 3.15, after the fall, there is this announcement made, there is going to be this war set up between the seed of the woman, God's plan for redemption, and the seed of the serpent who is going to try and stop this plan of redemption for the whole world. And we see this very thing in Pharaoh. Pharaoh is like the seed of the serpent. He's like the lion from the line of the enemy who's, who's kind of uh, come in and he's set up as the one who's trying to crush the seed of the woman. That's why he's trying to kill all the Hebrew baby boys so that no seed will ever come up. And he is like an agent of Satan who is trying to stop God's plan. But what we have to see here, it's very easy. And this sermon has some edges on it. And sometimes we need that. It's very easy to focus on what is bad. It's very easy to focus on the ominous words of this passage and actually miss the words of hope that ring all the way through it. Because you you see this in the text from verse 7. It says, But the people of Israel were fruitful, and they increased greatly. In verse 12, But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. In verse 20, And the people multiplied and grew very strong. You see, the author wants us to see that while everything seems very hopeless, something is building, something very good is underway. Something very good is going to happen. And when you turn over the page in your Bible to chapter 2, we see that there is again a set of ominous words, but not for the people of God. These are ominous words for God's enemies. In the ominous words of chapter 2, verse 1, say this. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman, and the woman conceived and bore a son. And of course, what we saw last week is this son, this deliverer, is born to this woman, and it's Moses. And he is going to be both the deliverer of God's people out of their suffering and out of their slavery, and he is also going to be the agent of God's judgment upon all of God's enemies. See, this, this, these words, you think about these words, she conceived and bore a son, these words have always caused a shuddering in hell because it reminds all the enemies of God that God wins. And this is so important for us to know in the time in which we live. We need to know all these things. God's people will go through suffering. We need to know why. 
He's setting us apart for himself. We must always stand on his side, but ultimately we must know that God wins in the end. Nothing can stop his plan of salvation. And so all of us need to choose by faith, the, the faith of the Hebrew midwives, we need to decide whose side that we are going to stand on. Are we going to stand on the side of God's enemies? Or are we going to stand on the side of God? In Luke chapter 2, verse 7, we read, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger. Herod tried to kill him, but God's plan to redeem the world will not be stopped. Jesus is rejected by his own people. He's sentenced to death on the cross. It may look like God is losing, but God's plan will not be stopped because Jesus rose again on the third day. As we live in these days, we must not go with the flow of evil. God's people must remember that God wins. By faith, we must choose the side of God. See, weeping may last for the night, but the Bible says that joy comes in the morning. This is our hope. This is what we need to hold on to. And we must not be distracted by the messages and the the things that are coming upon us in our day. We must stand on God's side. I want to invite you just for a moment to bow your heads. We're going to take communion and we're going to remember this very great truth that God wins. And that he wins because he's already won. When Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, he suffered in our place and he rose again on the third day. This morning I just want to address those who are in suffering. I don't want to minimise the pain and the moment of suffering. But also to say to let your suffering not drive you away from God, not cause you to go with the flow of evil, but instead to make you call out to the Lord, to call upon him for salvation, to call upon him for grace, to call upon him to sustain you through this time, to experience his presence in a way that you haven't before, to cling on to him in this time. It's so important for us not to find ourselves just rehearsing the ominous words of evil that are at play in the world. And that we're always experiencing and hearing bad news and actually fail to see the good news in this passage, that something very good is going to happen, that something very good is on the way. That's actually how we have to live. That's why Christians can actually not be bowled over by the rushing waters of evil in our time. Because we know And we have this sure hope that something very good is on the way. Something very good is happening. I want you to hear those words this morning in your heart. In your time of despair, in your time of suffering. No, the gospel tells me this. Something very good has already happened. Jesus has paid my debt. He's covered my sins. He suffered in my place. And he rose again to new life. And so will I. I will rise again to new life. All suffering and all pain will be gone. This life will just be momentary. That will be eternal. Something very good has happened. Something very good is on the way. They're the words we need to live by. Words of hope. Words that remind us God wins. I pray this morning that your faith would rise. You wouldn't have faith in your own faith. You know how sometimes we do that? We sort of look at our faith. We think, man, my faith is so weak. I've got nothing in there. Faith is not about mustering up your own strength. Faith is not a work. Faith is about looking at the object of your faith, seeing the victory that has been won on your behalf. And whatever, whatever, just resting in that, resting in that victory being refreshed in that victory, knowing that even though you feel like you're not going to make it, you are going to make it. God wins. 
something very good is on the way. Redemption will be complete. The enemy will be destroyed. You will be blessed in the truest sense of the word. Only some see this. Some live for today. Some seek to gain riches for today. Seek comfort and power and position for today. But those who have the Holy Spirit, those who have trusted in Jesus by faith, they don't live for this day. They live for the future and all that God has promised.